Hi, I'm Brian Poole and welcome to episode two of Green Screening. In this episode, we're going to continue on with what we talked about in episode one. We're going to look at some student and teacher projects uh, first, and then we're going to look at how we use video uh, in our learning management system and how we can incorporate it with lessons in general. Uh, and kind of some blended learning basics and philosophy. Then we're going to go a little bit further with OBS Studio and talk about how to uh, capture online video that we want to use in our classroom, either with our LMS or as backgrounds uh, for green screening, uh, as well as um, some advanced green screen uh, applications, how to, how to get green screen um, animations from online and how to incorporate those animations in with the lessons that we're recording to try to add a little bit extra to whatever we're trying to do and, and bring across to our students. Again, I understand that we're not entertainers, but the more we can do to capture the imagination and the attention of our students, the more successful we're going to be in our online learning presence in general. Okay, let's get started. Hello everyone. We are from the National So Challenge this is an example of students using green screening. Uh, this is our ag department doing one of their ads for the strawberry sale. They are standing there like this. Uh, they're not at a desk. This is cropped right here in their picture and then he's just taken and set them in front of a picture of a desk and put the emblems and stuff uh, on there to make it look like they're sitting in a news desk doing their broadcast on this. That's one student example and we're going to look at some uh, creative teacher examples next. Hey there National Trail Elementary, TJ and JT here reporting live from our studio at Blazer Time TV. Here's how our show works. Twice a week, we will broadcast from remote locations around the globe. Your goal for the week will be to use the clues to figure out our location and complete the challenge. Monday's show will be the main lesson for the week, featuring art and music clues. You'll need to tune back in on Wednesday of the same week for the big location reveal. I want to interject here. Uh, this is our elementary school art and um, music teachers. And I basically showed them OBS Studio in five minutes, actually less than I just did in this class, and um, set them up. Uh, uh, initially, they were using um, construction paper that was green, and then they moved to, I got them one of the green screens that uh, I use in my basement, and they're just using a Logitech uh, 1080p camera. Those mics have nothing to do with anything. They're just uh, for decorations. And they ran with stuff that just, um, made me laugh like crazy. So I'm going to let you keep watching theirs. We're going to look at a couple more of their videos too. You will also receive your challenge activity, which is your assignment for this week. The assignments will be a combined art and music lesson, which you will find on the middle page. We want you to upload a picture of your assignment and turn it in before the next Monday's episode. And remember, it's better to be a blazer. Explore! Where in the world are TJ and JT? Where in the world is your guest for today? Welcome back, Blazers. I'm Captain James Cook. And I am First Mate Zachary Hicks. We are reporting to you today from our first mystery location. Put on your thinking caps and get ready for the clues. Here we go. Clue number one. Let's take a listen to some music from our mystery location. Clue number two. Traditional art from this location includes carved wooden masks and petroglyphs. Petroglyphs, huh? Mm. Clue number three. A nickname for the most popular instrument in this location is called the jumping flea. Would you like to take a guess? Let's see what's in my bag. Ooh. Clue number four. This location is home to the happy face spider, and it's only found in our mystery location. They're really having fun, aren't they? 
Um, I want to point out this is their first video. This was done with the lowest resolution camera uh, that we had at the time. I, I, I'm not even sure uh, what that one was. Uh, it was done with a, um, this was a tablecloth from Dollar General. So you can see uh, from the one we just saw, which they made more recently with the 1080p Logitech camera um, and uh, a real green screen background, the difference between that and this, it worked and they used it and they had fun with it. Um, but as soon as I got them a little bit better materials, their resolution improved and their ability to green screen really improved in their videos. Ah! Oh, ah. I don't like spiders. Okay. Clue number five. Many artists like George R. use animals as their subject matter. In fact, animals are in the top 10 most popular subject matter in art. Hopefully you can see the difference between um, a low-end camera and a high-end camera. This is still a webcam. It's a 1080p Logitech webcam uh, that they mount on a tripod so that it pictures from level uh, with them. The quality is way better, better and with the good green screen background you can see how much better the green screening is. And do you recall the book by John Lithgow that I had mentioned in the last episode? Helpful. I really wanted you to see a couple examples that weren't mine from uh, both students and teachers, but I think that's enough and we should get moving forward. I did want to point out, which I'm sure you saw and I annotated there, the difference between having a higher quality background uh, like one that you can buy online versus going with the Dollar General tablecloth. It makes a pretty big difference. And the other thing there that made a big difference is going from a regular low end inexpensive webcam to the better 1080p Logitech, which obviously we saw a big difference uh, between that as well. Uh, but I think we've seen enough examples. So I want to talk about what we do with all these recordings that I'm talking about. Now I'm going to show you on our learning management system, which is Moodle, but I'm sure that Canvas, Schoology, um, Google Classroom, which is in itself a very limited version of a learning management system, uh, you can do these things there in a different manner. I'm going to show you how we do them to kind of show you a little application option uh, of how you might think about doing them in your classroom. So the first thing is, I talked about recording every class and I do record every class. Those are on my class calendar. So if we were to go, go in, for instance, in my hardware class to February 3rd and you click on that date, the recording of the class is posted right on the calendar. Um, and up top, it kind of says the, the subject of it. It was the conclusion of the memory section before uh, my memory test. But every class is there. Every class is recorded. And in this case, I used OBS Studio with a separate camera off to the side. So I'm still in the instruction. But it's not head-on, it's not green screen, but I did use OBS Studio with it. Uh, like I said previously in episode one, it's not as good. I'm not talking directly to the student. But if the student missed the class, it's better than just a screen capture. The students have said that when they try to make up classes, if they're trying to make up 40 minutes of class, and in, in an 80-minute period, there may be 40 minutes of instruction broken up that I paused in between, and the video may be 40 minutes long. This one is uh, 35 minutes long. We won't watch it. Um, it's broken up from an 80-minute classroom, and the idea of going to watch that if I was quarantining, if I was homesick, if I miss class for a field trip, um, without you, it's really grueling. Um, I did that for years, from 2005 until probably 2017. I'm not in the video, it might have been 18. When actually uh, my next door neighbor, uh, the uh, science teacher next door said, hey, I, I like watching your Tech Tuesdays. Or rather, he said, I like what I get out of Tech Tuesday, but I don't enjoy watching them because there's nobody in them and it's boring to watch a screen capture. He may have said grueling to watch a screen capture. And that's when I went, oh, okay. Uh, and I added a camera across the room. Um, it's got an optical zoom. 
I'll add that in uh, the links on this. That one is a good one just for this, just for putting it on a tripod. It's actually mounted to my lab desk on the other side of the room and points over so that when I'm teaching, I'm kind of looking at it. Um, you can see there, I'm kind of looking at the camera because I'm right-handed and the camera's over there. Um, so that's number one. Number one is include it in an easy place for students to find your instruction. I used to use, well, I still do use YouTube channels, uh, but playlists are hard to find. Which one's the one I missed? Calendars for students are really, really easy. You can post it on your Google Calendar. If you don't have a full LMS and you have a Google Drive that you just drop your videos in, get the shared link, post it in your Google Calendar, you've done the same thing. Um, obviously, you can link that Google Calendar to your Google Classroom if you are a Google district. If you're a full LMS district, you can put it a lot of other places as well. And what do I mean by that? So if we go back to um, this section, uh, Chapter 5, the CPU, I have a online book. Uh, I've taken away all of my um, printed reading material and replaced it with online books so the students have access to that material every single day. Whether they were, were one to one, take home high school. Um, so every single time they take their laptop home, which should be every day, they can get that material if they need to. The other thing is I found that putting all my material online is really UDL. It allows my students that are on IEPs, on 504s, to review that material and get it that way. Plus, because it's posted on the screen reader, they can use Chrome. I mean, because it's posted on the LMS, they can use Chrome screen reader with Read and Write for Google Chrome to read them the material if they're uh, behind in their reading comprehension. Last year, I had a student that was fifth grade reading level. And he ended up with my class with an A minus. In fact, the IEP uh, kind of said he wouldn't be able to take my class. The counselor said, hey, I don't know if he should take your class because of his reading comprehension and the level of material that you go through. And my response to her was, my son is on an IEP. I expect his teachers to do all these things why wouldn't you think I would do all these things for students that aren't mine? So um, that's part of the reason I, I changed some of my content and pre-recorded all my lessons. So those students that don't read as well have all those things that might have been um, hard for them to get now posted with the reading material and the lecture related to it right there. Also, one of the things I did when I recorded uh, my lessons was um, to make sure that also in that material for my students, I also post the actual, oh, not the one I wanted, but that's okay, the actual PDF of all the class notes that I set up to take ahead of time. So if that student needs guided notes, they, all they have to do is go there, click on there to get the guided notes. But all the videos that I've done are pre-recorded and put in the class book, uh, as well as being on the class calendar. Blended learning, where does that come into all this? I have set up in my classes, in fact, let's go to those class notes real fast to show you what I'm talking about. Um, pauses that I didn't have before in my class. So if you go to my notes, all of a sudden you'll see a big red block. And that red spot comes up on my smart notebook when I'm teaching that says, hey, stop, stop now. And that's the point where uh, in the lecture in class, um, the students would go and say, hey, they've got to take the memory view um, quiz, formative, I'm sorry, yeah, formative assessment. That's also where the video is also posted. So if a student is online, It'll say on the calendar due today is memory intro review. Uh, they know that they have to watch this video, which is, I try to keep them less than, oh, there we go. That one's four minutes and 48 seconds. Um, my objective is five to 10 minutes with a maximum of 15 minutes on any one lesson. 
So today's class, if you were online, might be watch this video, take this quiz on the what we learned on the video to give me formative uh, feedback. And they have to get a 90% on that formative quiz before they can move on to the, the project that we do later in the course. They don't have to do it today. They don't have to get a 90% right now the first time they take it. But it lets me know, okay, where were they? Because I can look at all the first attempts on the quizzes. And then as we go through the teaching process, we have this section and then we go through this section and there's a formative assessment every single time that makes it blended learning for the students that are at home. Number one, they can watch it anytime, any place, any mode. They can watch it on an iPad. They can watch it on because they're YouTube embedded. Um, they can watch it on their phone. They can take the quiz on any of those things as we move through uh, the material. So all those videos I make are embedded on the calendar. If I taught the lesson in class, they're embedded in the book um, that I have way all set up before we get to that section. And then in each individual lesson, um, they're embedded in an online blended activity that if they were there, they watch the video. If they're not, or, I'm sorry, if they're not there, they watch the video. If they are there, we just take a 10 minute break, take the quiz, and then we'll move on to the next section. Next section, same thing, different video, different quiz. It mentions what section of the book that we, that this applies to for chapter six. And as they go through these activities, um, they eventually get to the point where we do our um, project. And in my class is very project-based learning. We do obviously lectures and reading, and then we culminate it through a project. So before they can get to the project, they have to take the pre-project skirmish, it's a quiz, but they can't even see that until they've got a 90% on every single one of these ahead of time. So that's their homework at night, to re-watch the video, retake the quiz, get a 90 to 100%. Um, obviously I have students that retake it multiple times, but oftentimes I don't. They watch it one time again, get 100% and they move on. So they've got to have a 90% on everything to see this. That's one of the things that a full learning management system does. It lets you set restrictions before this section opens up where they can see the project, choose what project they're going to do, see what the rubric is going to be, um, and move on. And I will say, in general, that's one of the great things about a full learning management system. You can't see all those restrictions right now, and neither can students. If I go back to my normal profile here, you can see all the restrictions that popped up. So they can't see the chapter activities and the first thing until they've done the self-assessment. They can't see the second thing until they've done the first thing. All those things, it's called having your class gamified. All those things appear magically when they get other things done. Uh, and based on who you are and what group you're in, different things appear in my class. For instance, I'll go back to chapter five since I'm not sure if I set it up in chapter six. When they get down to the um, final class fight, uh, the, the test at the end of the section, um, they have, there's a chapter five fight. If you do not belong to 504 or IP group, Chapter five fight, uh, if you belong to 504 IEP group. The student sitting next to you has no idea that the thing you clicked on goes somewhere different. They don't know that you have half the test questions or modified test questions with half the options on multiple choice. That's one of the things that a full learning management system lets you do, um, lets you truly modify your class for the student and they don't even know that it's going on in the background. Okay, I've said enough. That's the way we use those videos. We embed them in the calendar. We embed them in activities. Doesn't have to be a quiz. Moodle has tons of different activities that you can uh, embed those videos in to get formative feedback. And I'm sure, having not used Canvas, Schoology, any of the other ones, I'm sure those also have the ability to embed the videos that you make into activities to make them truly blended learning activities. Let's move on to the next section, which is talking about advanced things we can do with OBS Studio, specifically how can we get online video using OBS video 
to use in our classroom with our LMS and with OBS projects. First of all, I want to talk about how to harvest a video off of YouTube. I'm going to just pull one up here. Now, first of all, before I do that, I always go over here and check that we're on auto or off of auto and onto the HD version of that video. So I've got a YouTube video up here that I want to record. In this case, I would have my mic off and I would have the um, desktop audio on if I wanted to get the sound of it and off if I didn't. I've got it full screen in OBS Studio. I've got no other cameras on at all. I would hit start recording and then go ahead and start that video and then get off that screen. So in this case, I'm going to say, hey, you know what, I need to start recording. I've already previewed this once. I want to get the part when we're actually flying through the Grand Canyon. So I'm going to get ready for that. Boom, there I'm flying through the Grand Canyon. It's got some really cool video of this that we're going to use in just a second. So I've got that video and now I want to fly through that mountain in a X-Wing. So I'm going to go ahead and go here. Now, this is a green screen video and I just Googled green screen X-Wing cockpit to find what I wanted. And again, I'm going to go full screen and I'm going to make sure we're not on auto. I'm going to go all the way to 1080p. I'm going to rewind this sucker and I'm going to get ready to record it. So I'm going to hit play and come off the screen and I'm going to start recording. And I know I want to stop on this one at 15 seconds to make sure that I get exactly what I want and no add at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and add the first video. So I'm going to add a media source. I'm going to, I can name it. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and browse to where I record my videos. And I'm going to add that video in there and say, okay. So now I've got this, I'm going to double click on it. Oh, wrong one. Cancel. I'm going to double click on it and I'm going to make it loop and say, okay. And you know what? I'm going to make sure it fills up the entire screen as I'm flying through the Grand Canyon. There, there, there we go. Uh, and then I'm going to lock it. And then I'm going to add another uh, media, media source. Okay, I probably name it X-Wing. Right, I'm going to go and grab that one as well and say okay. So now I've got this X-Wing. I'm going to go and lock that one the way it, where it is. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to say I want to loop it. Say okay. And now it's just like a green screen. I'm going to right click on it and add a filter called chroma key. Okay, you can see that all went gray. You can already see the video I've got in the background flying through it. Oh, and our X-Wing isn't quite filling up the whole screen. That, that, we can't have that. Someone would notice that we weren't actually in an X-Wing. That would be crazy. There we go. Now we're filling up the whole thing. And now I'm going to add myself in a video and I don't have a camera here. Let me grab another camera. Toss this up here and we'll see how that works. Haven't used this one for green screening yet. I think I got it aimed at me relatively well. We'll see here. So I'm going to add a video capture device. Okay. Not that one. That's my classroom camera from across the room. Uh, is it this one? Yep. There we go. So I just added uh, this jelly comb camera that I just tossed on there. I'm going to make myself kind of big. I'm going to put myself approximately in the cockpit. Uh, and then again, I'm just going to right click, say filters. Add filter, chroma key. This is a $29 camera. There we go, close. And now I'm in an X-Wing. And if I had my Air Force uniform on and my flight helmet, it would add a little reality to my X-Wing fight. Let's all go on a trip right now and take a look at Pluto through a couple different ways that we could look at the same video footage. If we're in a science class and we're talking about, and this is a rendering of Pluto from New Horizons, if we're talking about Pluto, we can talk about it just like this, uh, or uh, we could be talking about it while we're sitting on the bridge of the Millennium Falcon doing a flyover of Pluto. When we talk about the type of green screen things that we can grab off of YouTube, there are a ton. Some of these will never fit into your class, 
but maybe some of them will. Maybe uh, there's something that you can use as a transition, as an intro at the beginning of the class or the beginning of a specific session that maybe draws your students into your subject matter you're about to talk about. If we're talking about the Civil War, we can go and find that video on the History Channel or some other YouTube site that talks about what's going on actually in the Civil War. I'm sorry, what went on actually in the Civil War. And we can interject and be part of that video. You could even be in costume like our teachers in art and, um, and music did. You can in interject yourself in that lesson as if you're a part of the lesson by using green screen interacted with uh, that video. Last thing I wanted to talk about is videos that require you to write on the screen. Khan Academy is great, but Khan Academy is a perfect example of no instructor present, no video, and students can get really, really bored with Khan Academy just hearing a voice and seeing letters written on the screen or numbers. There are teachers, like math teachers, that are like, well, how do I do this for me? Well, it's actually kind of easy. If you've got an iPad, and you've got the software to cast to your screen on an iPad, which everyone at National Trail does, you could just as easily um, take yourself and throw yourself kind of in the bottom corner down here so that you're still, they're still hearing your instruction uh, and seeing you when you're doing the instruction. Oops. And you're doing the instruction, but then I just take my iPad I cast it to my screen and I use my capacitive pen and now I can write with really good writing. Actually, this one's one of the best ones I've seen at Khan Academy. If you watch some of the videos, the writing is not cl as clear as I would say that we would like it to be. You can also pull up on your iPad a picture of lettered paper that you're writing on using any of the iPad tools that let you interactive and draw. And since you're casting it to your screen, it catches through your video, it catches your audio, and it catches what you're trying to show your students. Adding that extra level of you in the instruction that you're presenting to your students. Hi, right, well, I'm gonna record this on how to um, use Caden Live. Just so you know, I am using uh, NVIDIA Broadcast for both the microphone and for the camera. Uh, and that's what's doing the uh, green screening of me on this recording of the video. Um, I don't have a green screen where I'm at, but um, it works just fine, as you can see. So let's look at Caden Live. It is a multi-platform free software that will let you export as high as 4K. And I have switched to it as my primary editing uh, tool because it's free, easy, and anytime I want to know how to do something, I just Google it and I find a YouTube video on how to do it. So let's look at the basic. Uh, this is where the videos go. This lets me preview any video that's over here. This lets me preview what's in the timeline down here. Right now in the timeline, it's got one video stream, an associated audio stream, a second video stream, a second associated audio stream. And I'll kind of show you how that works. I'm going to go ahead and drop drop the video I want to edit in here, and I'm going to edit the actual green screen lesson that I did a couple years ago as an example. And this video that I'm making, I'm going to edit into it uh, and add it where I originally talked about a different piece of software. So here's this one. If I push right here, I'll preview this video if I wanted to. Um, if I drag it down here to the actual timeline, now you can see it's over here. And wherever I'm at on the timeline is what I'm previewing uh, the spot that I'm editing. I'm going to show you first how to copy and, and uh, cut into a video. I'm going to try to find the spot where I um, started talking about Movie Maker which is a terrible tool in comparison. And it looks like it's right here. This is when I faded out uh, and faded into the next tool. So I'm gonna cut it right here. So I put it where I want it. You can, by the way, zoom in by hitting the plus minus key or um, holding down the control key and using the scroll. You can see I'm zooming in more and more and more so I can get a more uh, perfect place that I want to cut this video right when I stop talking there. Now I right click and one of my options is cut clip and now this is two separate clips. And if I had another one that I wanted to edit in there, I could put it on the other side. 
uh, and have it fade between one clip and the other. Right now, it's going from one clip to the other. I'm going to show you how to do the fades as we add different clips together. I suppose I should move myself so I'm not on top of uh, what I'm looking at. Uh, so I'm looking at this uh, uh, clip right here. Now, if I wanted to, I can just hit delete and I can add another clip in there, which is what I'm going to do when I finalize this video. Um, so if I had another clip that I wanted to edit in there, here, I'm just going to go ahead and delete this one. If I had another clip, I'll go ahead and throw episode one in here uh, as what I'm going to fade into. So you can see I've got episode one and two, and I can throw the other video right here, and I can make it fade between the two. The way I'm going to do that is if I hold my button right here, you see that circle show up? That is now going to let this one fade in uh, and I can do the same thing with the audio I can fade in the audio so that this now when I go between the two I can Thank play here and see what it looks student. like faded right into the other video likewise if I wanted to I could fade out the one that I'm looking at but you really don't need to fade out and fade in um, the fade in will slowly cover up the other one so I generally don't fade out videos I just fade in the new one you can also see that whatever is on top is what fades in so if I went for instance and had this one up here and this one down here you would never see the fade You're because your the one on top has priority so if I want to fade, I need to make sure the one that's fading is on the outside of the one I'm fading into. Um, and I could make that fade longer if I wanted to, so that it was a more gradual fade into uh, the video. And you'll see what this one looks like here. As the I level go and of that. you in the instruction that you're presenting to your student. There we go. That's a little more gentle fade that you saw there on the way in and the way out. Now, audio levels of these two videos that I just put together may not match. I can use the audio mixer button here to adjust individual tracks. This adjusts the whole track. So if I, if I have a whole bunch of videos coming along down through here, it's going to adjust them all. But in general, I use this one because it's pretty easy. If I have one that's a little louder than I want it to be, I can adjust the decibel range really easily right here with the audio mixer. And this is also where if I've done a recording and it's really loud, or if I've done a recording and it's really soft, I can adjust the overall master of the output so that I end up getting what I'm looking for, which is to hear it fine at 70% um, so that somebody who's hearing impaired can turning it up more and someone who's hearing sensitive can turn me obviously down. I don't want it to be that if someone wants to listen to it, you've probably seen this on many uh, YouTube videos, where you have to go all the way to one extreme in order to even hear the person who's giving a class um, or teaching you how to do something. And that's um, uh, very frustrating when you can't hear the person trying to give you the instruction. So I like to uh, try to adjust that as uh, necessary. So that's how we fade in and out. How do we cut and how do we uh, insert videos into and all I have to do is drag another one and insert it over here and I can again hold down the control key and use the scroll to make this smaller so that I can go and find other spots that for instance I'm going to cut and add uh, to the video as I go. Okay, I want to jump back a little bit. Um, I showed you that there's two tracks right now that that you can see. You can add as many other tracks as you want to. So if you've got other ones of different varying volumes, you can just right click down here on any of the tracks and say insert track and you can add additional and I always do AV tracks uh, and it you can say hey, it's above track one you can say it's below track one when I add it now you can see it's further on the outside so the video will be further on the outside of the track and will override this one so you'd fade down basically if you do that also it there are tons of tools you can put uh, pictures in here it doesn't have to be video you can do text overlays on top of it um, the anything that you've probably ever seen done on any vision video uh, piece of software you can probably do on here including uh, things like um, 
covering up students' faces. You can have track the face so that it blurs uh, students if you need to do that on our video. I've had to do that for uh, security tapes before, just as an example. But what I wanted to show you is how to finish the project up. So I'm going to go and act like this is uh, the way I wanted it, and it's all done. And I'm going to show you how to render or finish it. By the way, if you hit File, Save, like this, I'm going to say... Um, that didn't make a video. All that did was save the project that I'm working on. So if I have something I'm working on and I want to leave and come back to it, I can. Um, but if I want to finish the project, which is called rendering, I'm going to render the project. So you can see the button right up here. It says render. It pops up and I've already got a custom one made, um, but you can pick any of these uh, profiles that are already made under here. I do um, the ultra high definition 4K because I'm going to render to as high definition as I can, and then I'm going to upload it to YouTube and I'm going to delete it. This one makes a very large file or a larger file. Um, I wouldn't say very large, but I don't keep it. I delete it when I'm done. Uh, and once I've seen that it's uh, up on YouTube in there. So I use the ultra high definition 4K MP, MP4 right there. Past that, you can use it just like the defaults. I, I can just go with that. It's going to always go into my video folder, although I can choose another location for it right there. And as soon as I've got the setup, I just say render to file. You can see this is a little over 25 minutes. Um, so I hit render. It's going to take a while to do that. We'll see how long it says that it's going to take to actually render this 25-minute uh, file. So it just resolved at around 16 minutes. So I don't know actually how long is this file altogether. It's 30 minutes. So about uh, it's 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 going down really fast. By the way, I've got a 2060. A GTX 2060 video card in this particular PC, uh, 32 gig of RAM, and it's it's not an overly powerful computer. Having the video card in it certainly helps. So let's say it's going to take about 40% of the length of the video to do that rendering and finish that video. That is it for Caden Live. Um, I really wanted to go over it real quickly so that you would have a way to edit the things. You can see I put a I have a whole. Uh, intake and outtake of all my uh, trainings that I have on on my videos uh, that I fade into all of them just so people know they're on my channel. Um, it's pretty easy. It's pretty simple to use and everything I need to know is is I found on YouTube on how to use Caden Live. So not overly difficult piece of software. Hopefully between the two episodes, you got what you needed on how to green screen and how to do basic editing uh, to get you started at your school.